to do for this talk is uh, explore something around the topic of compassion. And uh, as that's something I've been exploring and considering for myself lately. And as I introduce this topic or talk about it, I want to mention that um, I don't really know what it is. And that's a little bit of a remarkable thing to say, given that uh, I feel it's been one of the central organizing principles of my life for much of my adult life. And so it's been very important for me. And, um, and part of the reason I don't feel like I maybe don't understand what this is, is that I've had a shift, uh, kind of shifting perspective on what I have identified inside of me as compassion. Maybe it's not, not the quite the right label for it. And, um, and so that's uh, kind of the, what I'm going to consider here with you today. So um, certainly compassion has been very important for me, it, or I've considered it very important, uh, since the time early years of my practice. <clears throat> when I started in uh, Zen practice, uh, compassion, what I identified as compassion, snuck in on me through the back door. I was not doing Zen to discover or become compassionate. Uh, and so it was not really in my, the idea of compassion was not in my working vocabulary. I mean, I kind of knew what it meant, but it had no relevance for me at all, uh, particularly. Uh, but I did suffer a lot. And, um, and uh, in retrospect, I realized that as I practiced, that uh, kind of intensively practicing the Zen practice and Zen meditation, that um, I started to... Um, it, uh, see, perceive, compassion in the world. But in a, in a very subjective way, it was like the breeze would be compassionate and it would kind of compassionately care for me, kind of bring, uh, uh, blow against my cheek and, and I felt, oh, I'm being cared for a little bit here. Or I'd see uh, particular objects. I remember seeing was particular abstract statue that I would see regularly. And, and I was convinced that that was a statue of the embodiment of compassion. Only many years later to discover that that was not the artist's intention. Uh, the artist's intention was it was a, a, a flame. <laughs> 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 and so somehow that, you know, it worked as compassion for me. And particular people also, I thought, oh, that's, that person's really compassionate and, and it w would kind of nourish me or inspire me and be meaningful for me. And uh, at least one of those people, I told someone else someday, oh yeah, that person was so compassionate and their eyes went wide. And, you know, you gotta be kidding. <laughs> and um, so anybody would see it everywhere around me and I would, I started doing a lot of drawing and, and, um, and I would draw uh, com uh, uh, pictures of uh, Kuan Yin, Avalokiteshvara, the, the and Bodhisattva, the being of compassion and uh, as a way, and I didn't know what I was doing, I was just doing it. and. I also had pictures of Kuan Yin on my wall in my monastic room. And so clearly compassion was important. It was it kept coming in in all kinds of ways. And also in retrospect, I realized that I kept doing Zen practice, that um, something inside of me started to thaw or to melt or that uh, it was being tenderized, like the crust of my heart was being tenderized. And I became much more sensitive to, uh, you know, heartfully sensitive to myself and the world. And, um, and uh, I wasn't really thinking about it or even identifying it initially that this was even happening to me, but it was just kind of going along and happening. And then uh, at one point I encountered a serious amount of suffering in the world, and um, not, not my own, but in, uh, elsewhere. And uh, it had a big impact on me. And uh, it was a formative moment where I think it led me to want to uh, devote my life to somehow respond to the suffering of the world and make a difference and try to alleviate suffering in some way or other. And that's been kind of the organizing principle for my adult life um, to, to a large extent. And in the Zen practice, that was uh, encapsulated in what's called the bodhisattva vow. Uh, there's a certain dedication or aspiration that you make in the Zen practice and it's usually worded something like, beings are numberless, I vow to save them all. And, um, and so it's like a hopeless task, right? 
<laughs> but you're committed to doing it. And, 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 and it wasn't so much that I took on this idea as something external to me. It was rather that, that uh, uh, we were chanted regularly at Zen Center, this thing. And at some point, these words resonated or, or spoke or mirrored what was changing inside of me. And so to make the Bodhisattva vow wasn't so much to take on something external, but was to acknowledge and, uh, and kind of affirm what was happening inside of me, this desire to be responsive to the suffering of the world. So that, I went merrily along with this idea for a long time. And uh, it was a little bit interesting then in retrospect that at some point I started to do vipassana practice. I stopped doing a lot of Zen and did this practice that we, I teach here, what we do here at IMC. And, um, and uh, there in this kind of tradition, which was to me was a little bit foreign, foreign tradition. I hadn't been, you know, I've been doing Zen for all these years. And they did a, a strange sentimental thing in this tradition. And I thought, like, wow, you know, this is these people are a little bit too sentimental. And they, they practiced loving kindness. And, you know, Zen is like, you know, <laughs> 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 you know, you're just like, you know, it's a little more, a little strict than, and, um, and uh, some, some Zen, you know, there's not, kindness is not always uh, a strong suit of some, some, era, some schools of Zen. Like, yeah, boy, in, I practiced Zen in Japan for a while, and, and uh, if it was kindness, it was tough kindness, tough love. <laughs> As they came around with a stick, and during meditation, whack, 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 they hit you over the shoulders. It was like this loud whack, and sometimes you never knew when they were coming. And, and uh, it never didn't happen to me when I was there, but uh, sometimes these sticks were known to break as they would strike them across. So it, maybe it's like some kind of kindness. <laughs> you know, the the idea was that uh, in certain cultures, certain night, certain areas, the idea is that you're kind if you really are strict with people and really want the best in them, and you really kind of push them to really, you know, you know, grow and develop and become free. And so. That was the, the, the kind of the under background. It was a kind of a kindness, but it wasn't the kind of kindness that someone who kind of grew up in California <laughs> with Bambi movies or something <laughs> would uh, easily identify as such. So when I came into this loving kindness thing in Vipassana, it's like, you know, you know I just kind of tuned it out, you know. It wasn't interesting for me. And, um, but then as I did this mindfulness practice, to my surprise, uh, I started at a, uh, this, this deeper kind of tenderness, deeper kind of sensitivity, heartfeltness began to kind of bubble up on its own. And um, it seemed like it was characterized by a lot of love. And uh, it seemed when they, then when they started talking about it, or they actually started doing uh, loving kindness guided meditations, I said, oh, that's what they're talking about. And again, it wasn't that I had to then import something outside, do you know, take on something that teachers were teaching me. It was I found it in my, something in myself that resonated what they were saying. And then, okay, let me take that, that feeling, that sense, and let me kind of work with that and expand it or spread it or something. And, uh, and that worked really well for me. So in both these traditions, somehow in the Zen, what awoke in me was what I thought was compassion. And in Vipassana, what awoke in me was something that I identified as loving kindness or metta. And I've always wondered, without any conclusions, whether there was something about the nature of Zen practice and Vipassana practice that uh, lended itself to, to cultivating one or the other. Or whether it's just simply a developmental stages of my own practice, that I had so much suffering when I was a new practitioner, that compassion was really the salient kind of concern and that as, uh, as I you know, worked through all that, by the time I did Vipassana, I was not really, I had a lot of personal suffering anymore. I kind of worked through a lot of it and felt pretty integrated, pretty stable. And so with that as a foundation, then the Vipassana practice could open to something different maybe. So I don't, I don't have a clear answer for these things. And as I said at the beginning, I don't know what I'm talking about. Uh, but uh, but the, I don't have to know what I'm talking about uh, to know that I was changed by all this. So I know that something very important happened to me, and now it's the issue is like, what, what really did happen? You know, and m maybe the understanding has some importance, but it's not the, you know, especially if you're gonna talk about it. And, but uh, it's, you know, it's, uh, it's doing the practice and being changed by it, which I really 
cherish, and exactly how I understand it is a little bit secondary. So then, um, uh, in the last couple of months, I took a, a dive into this ancient literature of the suttas, the discourses of the Buddha, and I, I like spending time studying these texts, not because I believe that they are the embodiment of truth, but I still find them um, to be fascinating texts uh, of a certain exploration of the heart, the mind, that went on 2,500 years ago in a different culture at a very different time. And, uh, and so there's a kind of a different perspective that I'm used to, to looking at my life. And I still find that it's a, makes a nice mirror for me and to see myself, to question myself, to question my Western cultural assumptions, kind of to be able to kind of see myself in a new way. And I found it particularly helpful in terms of my own Buddhist practice to do that. It kind of opens doors and questions. And, and I, so I refer a lot to these early texts. And some people probably think I'm a fundamentalist because of it. Um, but um, I don't always agree with what's in there. Uh, I just find it fascinating still. And someday I'll probably get over it. But I still find it very meaningful, very inspiring, and I have a lot of respect for these ancient texts and what's in it. So uh, in the last couple of months, I decided to take a deeper look at compassion. And I was kind of, kind of, I was very surprised what I discovered. And that's what I discovered that uh, got me to kind of reconsider, uh, uh, you know, uh, what com this compassion thing is, or wh what, what I call compassion myself. Maybe it's something else and, and all this. And so, um, so there's a word in this ancient language in, in Buddhism that's most commonly translated into English as compassion. And that's the word karuna. Probably many of you have heard it. It's the it's, uh, same word is used in Mahayana Buddhism, Buddhism of Tibet, and you know, when they use Sanskrit, and uh, in, 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 in Japanese Buddhism, Mahay they use the same word. And it's, um, nowadays it's most commonly translated as compassion. In 1880, one of the first English translations of these ancient texts, it was translated as pity. And uh, I think for most people in California now, the word pity is uh, almost like a, I don't know, a bad word. You know, you don't want to have pity. Pity, have pity for people is that now uh, has the connotations of kind of looking down at them and, you know, feeling sorry for them in a kind of, a, kind of pitiful way. And, uh, but I suspect that in 1880, the, the word in English, pity, had a different meaning, didn't have the same connotations we have today. So we have to be a little bit careful and generous about the 1880 translators. But anyway, pity, compassion. Nowadays is compassion. So I decided, well, I'll look and see how this word karuna is used in the ancient suttas. And to my surprise, it's only, except for a couple of very minor exceptions, it's only used um, uh, in relationship to meditation practice. It's never used as a description of what motivates a person to be concerned with the suffering of other people and wish that suffering to be alleviated and to do something about it, to help people. Um, it's never, never used that way. Uh, so that was kind of odd. Uh, the, as a meditation practice, it's uh, primarily used as one of the four Brahma Viharas, the four divine abodes, the four uh, meditation practices. Um, usually in English, we say loving kindness, compassion, sympathetic joy, and equanimity. They're beautiful meditation practices, and the way they're described in the suttas is developing this meditation practice to a point of very deep absorption, very deep concentration, uh, where a uh, person's radiating uh, uh, these qualities boundlessly throughout the universe, just kind of spreading in all directions, kind of radiating it out. And the other way it's described, also a part of meditation, is that in this deep state of concentration, uh, the hindrances in one's attachments aren't really operating. And so one gets a taste of what it's like to have a liberated mind. And so it's called, uh, so in terms of compassion, it's called experiencing uh, the liberation of mind based on compassion, or this karuna. So again, both of these are meditation practices, you know, these references. And um, nothing about doing anything in the world or caring about anyone. And there's no definition for this word karuna in the ancient texts. 
So you can't kind of go in there and you know, get a definition. This is what it means. Um, so what is it? You know, what is this word? And if it happens in deep meditation, there's not a lot of cognitive operation going on in very deep concentration states. There could be a radiating of a feeling, but the idea of cognitively reflecting on people's suffering and considering it, taking it in, experiencing it, wanting to do something about it, is cognitively much more complicated than generally goes on in very deep meditation practice. So the, the, the very examples of where it's used, it doesn't really speak to what we would think of as compassion. Maybe it is, since it's not defined, but is compassion really the right definition for it? The word for it. But then, uh, I looked around in these ancient texts, and there's another word that is used when the, this ancient text talks about being concerned with the welfare of others. If uh, uh, the Buddha or monastic goes to teach others, the person does it out of, and the word is anukampa. And A-N-U-K-A-M-P-A, -A -A, Anukampa. And um, Anukampa is, uh, if, someone, if you ask someone to teach, you say, will you come and teach, teach me or teach us out of Anukampa. The Buddha, when he wanted to send forth his first 60 enlightened disciples to go teach in the world, he said, go out uh, with Anukampa for the welfare of the world. And... Um, and a kampa is a, is a, anytime there's an active act of doing something for other people to benefit other people in the suttas, they use the word anukampa. They don't use the word karuna. And uh, now Bhikkhu Bodhi, the famous translator, does translate this word as anukampa. And for those of you who know the word, the monk Anal Analio, he also translates it as, as compassion. Uh, so both, uh, both, uh, uh, both these two translators as compassion, and then they conflate these two and treat uh, karuna and okampa as the same thing, as if there's no distinction between them. And especially wonderful, wonderful scholar Analio, um, he's written about this, but you don't, can't, uh, in his writings, tease apart that he's actually talking about two different words, because in English he translates them the same as compassion. He seems like he's talking about ex the same thing. But in these ancient texts, the word anukampa is much wider in meaning or, uh, than, it, than in uh, having compassion and concern for the suffering of others. And it, it's having concern and desire for the welfare of others. And being concerned for the welfare of others is a broader idea than uh, simply being concerned with people wanting not to suffer, wanting to alleviate that suffering. And um, it's, it's like uh, compassion is a subcategory of anukampa. Because to want the, you can want the welfare of people who aren't suffering. And uh, you could want other things for people besides not to suffer. You could want them to be joyful, to be happy, uh, and to be, you know, all kinds of th wonderful things. And in fact, for uh, the deepening of Buddhist meditation practice, uh, it goes, uh, the deeper stages of Buddhist practice um, uh, uh, begin when a person is no longer suffering in an ordinary kind of way. Uh, in deep meditation practice, one's personal suffering has receded and disappeared and uh, has no relevance anymore for that, those deep stage, stages. And so to be concerned with people's suffering in those deep stages is, doesn't quite, you know, doesn't, not, doesn't directly uh, relate. What relates is let's help the person uh, develop their welfare and well-being even greater. And so, um, so the word, uh, this word karuna, usually translated as compassion in the ancient texts, um, uh, only is used in reference to meditation practice, and it only appears in 63 passages. It's, I, don't, I didn't count each one because <laughs> there are software that help you count. The <laughs> And, um, and the, um, but the anukampa occurs in 163 passages. It's almost three times more prevalent in the text, this anukampa. It's anukampa is what parents have for their children, friends have for friends, teachers, uh, all kinds of teachers have for their students. It's a, it's a, it's, it's a, you know, very commonly it's assumed good quality of concern for others 
that's emphasized in the suttas. The Buddha expects the monastic disciples to have anakampa for the, everyone else, for the fellow monastics and for lay people. And, um, and this concern for the welfare of others to have anakampa is said to be of two kinds, material anakampa and spiritual anakampa. Material is to be concerned with people's material well-being, to have enough food and so forth. And, um, and, um, and spiritual probably has to do with their spiritual welfare, or the welfare of their heart or their inner life. Um, anukampa, this is a wonderful word, is also what apparently motivates people not to kill each other. And so that's, you know, it's a, it's a pretty good one. <laughs> um, it also, if a person lets go of ill will, then uh, the expectation is anukampa will be there. So what is this word anukampa? How do we translate it into English if we don't use the word compassion? And the reason not to do compassion is that it concerns the welfare of people, not just alleviating suffering. And um, so in looking at all these texts and looking at the context of it all, the best guess that I have for how to translate it into English, and the one that resonates for me at the, this moment as being most meaningful, is the word care or caring. It's a modest word to care and caring. It, at least it's in my, in my little head, it's more modest than the word compassion, which is kind of a heavy, big word. And, um, and it's very simple. And, uh, and for me, the, the difference between compassion, one of the difference between compassion and care is for, uh, there are times when the word compassion uh, comes with an imperative. It comes with an obligation. We're supposed to be compassionate. And you better be compassionate. And this is the way to be. But it's very rare that uh, I feel this weight of you're supposed to care. Uh, caring is just kind of what people do, maybe. And, and just there's no that sense of imperative. And, um, and where partly where I get that imperative is when I, in when I did my, my Zen training, where there was a lot of talk about compassion. And it was like everyone's supposed to cultivate compassion. That's the highest good. And people who aren't compassionate uh, are somehow looked down upon. You're supposed to cultivate, to cultivate and have it, and that's the be-all and end-all, is to have tremendous compassion. It's a beautiful ideal, but to make it the only ideal seems limiting. And to make it such a, so much weight on it uh, just seems also kind of limiting and a little bit kind of enclosing or oppressive for me. And um, a monk, Bhikkhu Analyo, has written a wonderful article called when com compassion became painful. And that's an interesting title. Com and, uh, and what he points out in his reading of the text, that compassion in the early literature, or early Indian Buddhism in, our, in a kind of early, early text, um, is never associated with experiencing the pain of other people. And the operating word here is experiencing. You might be concerned with the, with the, the, the suffering of others, but you wouldn't take it on in some deep, experiential, empathic way. In fact, for Analio, the whole point is, to, in this early tradition, is to have be free of suffering, be free of pain, and the path is to become free of suffering, uh, not to take on more. Whereas in the early Mahayana, there are sutras where they criticize this earlier tradition because they say, oh, those earlier people who were interested in just their own liberation, they're afraid of suffering. Yeah. And so, you know, I think Analio is kind of like, kind of, what, afraid of suffering? <laughs> You're supposed to suffer more? Um, and with the idea that uh, we're supposed to take on the suffering of others and take on the suffering of all beings and, um, and just experience it really deeply in ourselves. And some of the early Mahayana Sutras are very explicit about how you're supposed to really kind of be willing to experience the hellish experiences of suffering everyone has. And, um, and maybe so, maybe that's a way of uh, cultivating a very strong motivation to help other people and support other people and do the deep work of developing oneself spiritually to help the maximum amount of people. But uh, it is, compared to the early tradition, a little strange idea that compassion is something that's supposed to uh, allow you to experience suffering, more suffering of others. Can there be care and concern for others without actually, uh, in some kind of unhelpful way maybe, uh, 
empathically take on the suffering, you know, uh, uh, vicariously experiencing the suffering of others, uh, is that what's required? And I think the Theravadan tradi tradition would say, no, that's not required. In fact, it's counterproductive. Yes, please care for people. Please be concerned for their welfare and help their suffering and support people. Absolutely. But, uh, but don't take it on as a, you know, don't allow, don't somehow don't let it stick inside of you or don't identify with it or don't somehow let it uh, somehow, you know, I don't know where it's, you know, I don't know the psychological um, uh, mechanism all the cycle by which we experience vicariously the emotions of other people. Um, so some people say that compassion is not to sp as experience suffering with p other people, but to experience it, uh, because not, not, not to feel their suffering, but to care for their suffering, to, uh, to be concerned with their suffering as opposed to being with their suffering. So there's you know lots of discussion in the compassion world exactly what compassion is, and um, and I suspect that a lot of people don't know what it is, except if when they, you define it for yourself. This is the definition, and now we know. But this wonderful heart of ours, you know, has this range of capacities of concern of care, and uh, and so to translate it under kampa is care. When I started doing that for myself, then I said, oh Gil, I think that's what happened to you. There's a sweetness and there's openness and this gentleness. And I like the word tender. This tenderness that awoke in me in practice and um, that translates or is expressed as a care or concern for the world and a desire to do something to support the welfare of the world for sure. Absolutely. It's a powerful motivation for me. Sometimes it takes the form of what in English we can call compassion. And that's beautiful when that comes, in a, comes through in a clean way. And other times it comes through in other ways. Uh, but I don't feel like I have to be compassionate. Now, isn't that an outrageous thing for me to say? In certain Buddhist circles, I think it would be outrageous to say that. Uh, at least the way that I kind of felt the imperative of compassion sometimes going on. Uh, I very much hope, and I've staked my life kind of work, on the idea that this practice will uh, help people care for each other, care for our world in greater and greater ways. And I very much hope that compassion is one of those ways. Some people will specialize and have more compassion than others for whatever historical, biological uh, reasons, who knows why. And other people, perhaps their care will go in other directions. So what happens when I look at this ancient texts is that um, uh, even the word karuna, it's not obvious it should be translated as compassion. Uh, there's no, no, it's no obvious, uh, but uh, it, it partly depends on how we translate the, how we define the word compassion. So where do you go to get a definition? And so I went to a few different places, and the one place was the Oxford English Dictionary. And um, and uh, they had two definitions. The first one, which it claims was obsolete is uh, to have sympathy, sympathy for the sorrow and suffering of others. That's nice, but that's obsolete. <laughs> <laughs> so, no, don't bother with that. And uh, the other is um, to have sympathy or sorrow for the suffering of others and have the wish to alleviate that. So then I went to different dictionaries and, uh, and then I went to Oxford English Dictionary has an American Oxford Dictionary. <laughs> and, um, and, um, and in their American English Dictionary, uh, they had the obsolete definition. <laughs> so I wonder, you know, maybe there's different definitions in different cultures and different, different English people. In different, you know, there's so many different Englishes. I saw a book recently, it was, it was, I think the title was um, The Englishes. All the different ways people speak English. You know, there's legitimate ways of speaking English in different places around the world. So maybe the word compassion has different reference points in different English societies and cultures. And um, but 
the closest one that maybe you can sque uh, squeeze out of the, the word karuna in the ancient text is more like sympathy. It seems to have some, it seems to have some relationship to being concerned or being tuned in to suffering of others. But there's no reference really to want to do something or wish that suffering to, to, to end. So the idea of sympathy might be the best word. That to have sympathy for the world, sympathy for others. And what motivates caring for others is this word for anakampa. Um, so I'm now, at least this week, kind of a champion of this word anukampa. Why I repeat it so often for you so you remember it. <laughs> And, uh, and perhaps care or caring is not the best English translation, but it's the best one I could come up with. And um, the only one that I kind of uh, considered was bene benevolence. But uh, that's, a, that's not really in my working vocabulary, and I don't really, I'm not sure how I feel about benevolence. But, um, but care, I love care, and, and I think it's a humble, I feel, I feel like it's a humble or simple or very ordinary kind of thing. What's in, also interesting in this teachings of the Buddha is that nowhere in the text is anakampa explained to be something to cultivate and develop. It's just assumed that's there. Or maybe it's assumed that good people would have it. And my own experience has been this practice of both that meditation I've been doing all these years has been uh, the preeminent way, not the only way, but preeminent way in which my this tenderness or this warmth, heartedness, or this concern and care for the world that I'm living with um, has uh, uh, been awoken and grown and supported and developed in a way that um, um, you know has been very important for me. So in giving this talk, uh, I think part of the motiv motivation was to uh, encourage you or stimulate in you a reflection on what these caregiving instincts are for you. And, uh, and uh, what do you call compassion? And what's the role of compassion? What do you call, what do you, did anything identify in you that's different than compassion, this word care? And, um, and, uh, and what are the different uh, ways in which we have caregiving concerns for the world around us. Finally, I'll say that um, um, we have to be very careful when we are in one culture, like English-speaking cultures in America, to assume that the words that we take as being obvious and you know clearly built into the structure of the universe are actually inherent qualities of the human mind. So the, even the word compassion, we grew up with it, we use it a lot here in the West, and we know that of course there is this thing called compassion. But maybe it's a cultural construct, and that's why we don't see an obvious word in, in ancient India that fit that wor word, because they construct their psychological world or their interpersonal world in, in, with different words. and. Um, and clearly in the ancient world, people cared for each other. But uh, the different ways of talking about the care, uh, you know, understood that caregiving, had different categories of words. And, um, and so what happens if the word compassion disappears from our culture, from our vocabulary, and we have to find other words for our caregiving instincts? Does that free us or does that limit us? So anyway, so I hope this has been provocative. We have about 10 minutes, and now you can um, protest. <laughs> so I'm wondering if both care, compassion, whatever word you want to use for that emotion, I'm wondering if it has a very active aspect. So not just meditating, but buying a hom homeless person lunch or opening the door for an old woman, you know, things like that. Yes, yes. so the word anukampa is the word in the ancient texts for whenever someone's going to actively do something for someone else and, and helping that way. That's the word. So, yeah, please. Hey. 
I'm curious how you think about the word care relating to the word kindness. Mm -hmm. They seem really related to me and loving kindness. I would just love to hear you talk about the differences or how you think about distinctions. Yeah, good, good question. Um, <clears throat> I think that um, I wondered whether to translate karuna as kindness, but that doesn't. But if we translate metta as loving kindness, that doesn't work. But so I think maybe loving kindness should be translated as fr uh, friendliness, because that's the word metta is ca is directly connected to the word mitta, which means friend. And friendliness is a different feeling than kindness. Friendliness uh, involves some kind of uh, uh, you can you can be kind to your enemies, but you're not necessarily friendly with your enemies. This, you know, sort of a heartfelt feeling of kind of intimacy and sharing, or I don't know what. And uh, so there's a kind of a unique thing about feeling friendly that's different than kind. So maybe that's. Uh, but you're asking about the, the kindness and care. Um, I, you know, maybe I don't know. But I, I, looking at looking at myself as a reference point, if I'm allowed to do that, um, uh, you know, there are times when I'm grumpy. It happens ha known to happen, <laughs> and uh, or something like that, a little bit off, and. Um, and I don't have a lot of kindness, but I've noticed that I can still care. And so, you know, I, and with the, I might do things, like I might, I might be caring for my family, and um, and I, you know, I, I, I generally I think care about them and want to do something nice, but I wouldn't describe myself at that moment, those moments that I'm caring in that way as being kind. So, so that's my, that's my thing. But you, you, what, do you, what do you think? What you, what the difference between these words? Uh, they s at that distinction that you just made of um, almost intentionality or something like that to kindness is helpful for me. I think they seem so closely related. Oh, so kindness is more intentional and right. care is just a state of being right. almost. Oh, that's nice. I like that. So, uh, oh, where? Uh, yes, I had please. almost the same question. Wondering if you could contrast metta with anukampa, but you've pretty much answered that. that. Okay, okay, great. Um, <clears throat> um, as, as you were uh, speaking, so, something, uh, the first noble truth, suffering, recognizing suffering, um, and um, in your talk somewhere you mentioned that uh, compassion is not something it's not a meditative practice. I think that's how you said it. In, I'm in, not the, sure in, the sutta, in the sutta, karuna is only referred to in context of meditative practice. Yeah, I, I'm thinking of something else you said, but I, it scrambled around in my brain, so I'll, I'll, I'll just let it go. But um, uh, uh, what I, what I, the, the point of what I meant to say is that as one cultivates the understanding of suffering and uh, compassion came very late to me in life, as did the understanding of suffering. And um, uh, recognizing the universal nature of suffering, one kind of recognizes compassion for the for oneself and the, and the world. It it kind of arises right. by itself. So the, the so the question is. Well, it was about the thing that I was scrambled around in okay. my brain that I, that I, that I can't kind of the, access. Um, yeah, it was a big, uh, I mean, there's a, one of, the, one of the very important experiences in my life was um, uh, in a moment, just in a moment, in a moment, getting a clear sense of the magnitude of suffering in this world. When I was on retreat in, in, in long retreat in Burma, I was, you know, Mind, mindfully minding my own business, and, and then the boom, boom, and I was just like astounded by that, by it all. Great. So one of the things I've noticed when we do questions like this is that um, uh, it tends to be a, a very strong, high percentage of men who will get the mic first. <laughs> and I also notice that it's a high percentage of Caucasian men <laughs> who get the mic first. So I don't know if this is something all of us need to be a little bit more mindful of. And, um, 
And uh, just to kind of pause and kind of see if there's, you know, some people are a little bit just slower to pick it up and shyer and so. So, uh, but I saw your hand, so maybe we can pass the mic. So how does anu, anu, Anukampa, yes. is that it, relate to Sangha for you? Sangha? Yeah. Ah. Uh, I think that um, uh, one of the really uh, important principles of practice that's been valuable for me is the idea of mutual care, mutual benefit. That, uh, that in a Sangha, whether it's a particular meditation community that we practice with, or Sangha, so we feel a sense of, that sense of mutual, interact, interrelated caring for everyone in the world, that, um, uh, that uh, uh, Sangha has to do with a mutual care for each other. So it's not just a one-way thing. It's not like I care for you, and I'm, you know, I'm, so, I'm such a good person, and you know, I, I'll probably get some medals for being such a great, but rather it's more, a little bit more as equals, or more like we're all in it together. And the idea of care, for me, is that we're all in this life together and we care for each other. And sometimes I care for you, sometimes you care for me, and sometimes, and this mutuality that goes on. And so the mutual benefit, principle of mutual benefit is what I think characterizes uh, a really healthy Sangha. Is that true? Only one way? It's, it's mutual caring is Sangha. Uh-huh. Oh, so the word sangha literally means community, right? And so, so at least you know I can't speak now for the ancient tradition, but for me personally, that uh, anukampa goes in both directions. It's, anukampa is uh, is uh, I like to, I like to think of it in an ideal situation that we live in a world of mutual benefit, mm -hmm. mutual care. So it's more like one to one versus community. Oh, no. I th I think of sangha as a place where it's most obvious that we are all in it together. It's kind of a mutual caring going on. Great, so it's time. So I'm stay, if you want to ask, it's time to stop, but if you, I'm welcome to answer any questions uh, if you want to come up here now. And um, so I hope this has been interesting for you and provocative to give you something to think about and talk about with other people and explore these topics and, and, uh, and uh, and if not, and, and ideally, to somehow help with the tenderizing of your heart so that caregiving instincts that we all have can shine forth from you into the world. Thank you.